scripture reading today comes from Matthew chapter 2 and is, comes from the message. There will be selected verses. When the eighth day arrived, the day of circumcision, the child was named Jesus, the name given by the angel when he was conceived. Then, when the days stipulated by Moses for purification were completed, they took him up to Jerusalem to offer him to God as commanded, and also to sacrifice a pair of doves or two young pigeons as prescribed in God's law. In Jerusalem, at that time, there was a man, Simeon by name, a good man who lived in the prayerful expectancy of help for Israel. The Holy Spirit had told him that he would see the Messiah before he died. Led by the Spirit, he entered the temple. As the parents of Jesus brought him in to carry out the rituals of the law, Simeon took him in his arms and blessed God. Anna, the prophetess, was also there, a daughter of Balaam sorry, from the tribe of Asher. She was by now a very old woman. She had been married seven years and a widow for 84. She never left the temple area, worshiping day and night with her fasting and prayers. At the very same time Simeon was praying, she showed up, broke into an anthem of praises for God, and talked about the child to all who were waiting the freeing of Jerusalem. When they finished everything required by God in the law, they returned to Galilee and their own town of Nazareth. May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and laying of these words. Amen. Today's scripture reading is one of the very few gospel stories we have about Jesus' childhood. What Karen just read to us is often considered a continuation of the story of Jesus' birth. Luke tells us the story of a baby Jesus being presented at the, tem at the temple. There are two other persons named in this story, and they're Simeon and Anna. If you think back over the Gospel of Luke that we've read throughout Advent, it seems that Luke always includes a man and a woman a couple in most of their stories. Remember there was Elizabeth and Zachariah when they were announcing the coming of um, the coming of John the Baptist. There were Mary and Joseph being visited by the angels. And now we have these two very old people, Simeon and Anna, waiting at the temple, waiting and waiting and waiting for Jesus. Simeon was called a good man who had been waiting for the arrival of help for Israel. As, de as a devout Jewish man, he believed that this help was to come in fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. A Messiah was to come to save the people of Israel. And Anna was a very old woman, considered a prophetess. She was devout and had been worshiping and fasting and praying and waiting for all those years for the arrival of the one who was to flee Jerusalem. But both Simeon and Anna, without being told by any angels or anybody from the outside, recognized when Jesus was brought into that temple that he was the bringer of the long-awaited salvation. This scripture reading is a reminder to us that Jesus came as a fulfillment of years and years and years of Old Testament scriptures. Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and Anna and Simeon professed it this. We also learn from this reading that there were all sorts of traditions and rites that Jesus was, had gone through in the first few months of his life. There are so many rites and traditions related to the birth of a child, especially to the birth of the firstborn male child. We are told that the rite of circumcision was performed on the eighth day. We are told that the rite of naming took place, and that as Mary had been told by the angel Gabriel, that the baby was 
name Jesus. We are also told that Mary followed the rites of purification. In those days, on a Jewish tradition, a woman was considered unclean for 40 days after birth, and after those 40 days, she had to go to the temple and offer a sacrifice in order to be considered purified. Mary did, just as she was taught. And now we get to the, what happened on this day. The firstborn son of, was considered to belong to God in a very special way. Throughout the Old Testament, the firstborn son was dedicated to serve God. So Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple as required by law and tradition. We are told that this happened after Mary's purification had been completed. So this was not just one event that we're hearing today. This didn't all happen at one time. It happened over weeks and even over months. The offering that the family was expected to take when they presented their firstborn son was to be a sacrifice offered by the priests. If the family was rich, it would be a lamb, otherwise a pair of doves or young pigeons if the family was poor. As we know here, Mary and Joseph presented two young pigeons. So we see Mary and, faith, Mary and Joseph were faithful and devout Jews. They were faithful to the God of their ancestor. They followed the traditions of their community, and there were so very many traditions and rites to be followed. But we too have traditions. We like to think of ourselves as modern people, but we are tied to the past by many of the traditions that we follow today. In the United States, we have very specific traditions when it comes to some of our holidays. Just think about Christmas. We were talking about the tradition of some families have different traditions for putting up and taking down the Christmas tree. Some of us have traditions about what we eat on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. And we have many traditions in our church that we follow related to um, related to Christmas. Remember the Advent wreath, and how we light a candle every week, and how we lighted the Christ candle on Christmas Day. But if you think just about American traditions, probably one of the holidays that we have the most traditions around, and which is most American, is Thanksgiving. Everybody, I mean, I doubt there's maybe a handful of people that don't eat turkey on Thanksgiving, right? They don't serve Vegetables that have to do with the end of the, of the harvest year, things like pumpkin pie, things like sweet potatoes, all those kinds of things. Today and tomorrow, we'll be celebrating New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Do we have traditions to do with them? I think so. I think so. As a child, and maybe some of you in the, in the audience will remember this, my parents ate pickled herring. <laughs> pickled herring on New Year's Eve. This was a tradition from their childhood brought back from, by grandparents from Julia, Germany and Scandinavia. The eating of that traditional food was meant to assure a bounty of the New Year because herring was abundant in Western Europe. And my late husband, and some, some people in here probably remember this, always asked for a meal back black eyed peas, rice, and pork on New Year's Day. Now, if we grew up in the South, we would know what this meant. He grew up in South Georgia, and this tradition was meant to bring luck, prosperity, and peace in the New Year. So what other um, New Year's traditions do we celebrate? Do we watch that fall fall on Times Square? Maybe, if we can stay up till 11 o'clock. Do we watch fireworks? Maybe. But you know one thing that a lot of people do is make New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions are meant to change our behavior throughout the coming year, although statistically speaking, 43% of all people have given up on those resolutions by the end of January. <laughs> According to recent statistics in the Statista poll, the top three most popular resolutions for this year of 2024 are, drum roll please, exercise more, lose weight, they said eat healthier. The last one kind of 
surprised me because it moved up this year and saved money. Maybe because this is an election year. I don't know. So have you guys, has anybody in the audience made New Year's resolutions for this year? Nobody. Am I the only one? I tell you, every year I make a resolution to lose weight. Every single year. And if it's not that, then I say, just to be more generic, I will eat healthier, right? Or, more specific, I will quit drinking Dr. Pepper. Okay? So, what kind of resolution should we as Christians make? What if, instead of these resolutions about our physical body, we make resolutions to be more like Jesus? Every Sunday in his welcoming words, Pastor Dave says, Welcome to the Manuka United Methodist Church, where we are an inclusive gathering of found family, learning to be more like Jesus. Learning to be more like Jesus and actively serving the community. We learn about Jesus through listening to sermons, reading the Bible, attending Bible studies or church study groups. But now is the time to take what we have been learning and put it into action in 2024. What do you Amen. think? Amen. 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 Okay. Life is full of hurt and loss and needs and disappointments. Have you noticed that we are still in the midst of a pandemic? All of you are looking. This is not a pandemic of COVID that I'm talking about, or flu, or RSV, but a pandemic of meanness. A pandemic of hatred, intolerance, disrespect, and selfishness. We live in a world where it's okay for me to hurt you to get whatever I want, a world where we can say whatever we want to say on social media. A world where it is okay for kids to bully other kids to the point where some children find that suicide is the only option. A world where people with mental illness are considered less deserving of our health care and of our resources. A world where I can cuss out my child's teacher to get that better grade for my kid or to get my kid out of detention. A world where it's okay to yell at the cashier at the jewel because the wait in line was too long. A world where I can berate the teenager who works at the drive-thru at McDonald's when they ran out of Diet Coke. A world where I can't pull your thoughts because they don't matter to me. A world where I am right and you are wrong and there's no room for compromise. A world where war is justified if I want the land you have or I don't agree with your beliefs or your heritage. This pandemic of hatred, intolerance, disrespect, and selfishness has led us away from the unity of the people of God into division. Division in our families, division in our communities, division in our government, and division between nations. So what do we do? So, how does God tell us to relate to each other? Does God relate to us with meanness? No. Kindness is the way that God has always related to the human race. Jesus says in Luke, love your enemies and do good, and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He, God, is kind to the ungrateful and the selfish. Kind. Yeah. Our God is kind. The number of times kindness is mentioned in the Bible differs from one translation to another. The New King James Version mentions kindness 44 times, 37 times in the Old Testament and 7 in the New Testament. Kindness is considered a virtue. Haven't we all heard that? Our parents said kindness is a virtue. Kindness, kind people respond to each other ethically with concern and consideration. Kindness is not a weakness. Kindness is a trait that requires strength and bravery. Proverbs 
17, 22 states, what is desirable in man is kindness. I'll repeat that. It says, what is desirable in man is kindness. So what else does God expect from us in our relationship with other people? We find this in the Old Testament, Micah chapter 6. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does God require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. And in the New Testament, in Colossians chapter 3, we are told, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So what if our New Year's resolution this year was to be more like God and to reflect to others the actions of Jesus? What if we said, this year I will be kind? A kind person stands out in the crowd. It shows in their face, it shows in their actions. Being kind means sharing good words and good works. Good words cost nothing. Our words should reflect that we are followers of Jesus, not only in their content, but in their tone. We should look for opportunities to share the good news of the gospel and to show people that God is love, that God cares what happens to them, and that we care too. In my kitchen is hanging a plaque that we got from church many years ago. It's from 1 Corinthians 13. You know that, that scripture that's often read at weddings? It says a lot about how we should treat our family, those we love, and the world in general. It speaks to us about the meaning of being kind to those we love and those we live with. These are the words. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. This is the kindness Christ asked us to project to the world. We are not to speak in anger, hold grudges, or dishonor through our words. We are to be patient. We are to be kind. Next time we raise our voice in anger or post that angry response on social media, think of what we are doing. Who are we hurting? What kind of an example are we setting for our kids? Are we acting like Jesus? Ephesians 4.29 instructs us further on how to talk to one another. It says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who hear it. Yes, good words are important, and they certainly are a big part of being kind, but good works are another big part. Good works are helping someone in Jesus' name. They are done with the purpose of glorifying God and not glorifying ourselves. They are not done for the purpose of making us look good, or making us look generous, or making us look important. Anybody can do a good thing, but not anyone can do good works. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, we are told, and this is something that we need to take with us every day, tell those rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God, who piles on all the riches we could ever manage, to do good and be rich in helping others, and to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, they will build a treasury that will last forever, gaining life that is truly life. If we see a need, if we feel moved to a 
address it, and if we have the capacity to do so, Paul is telling us that we need to do it. So to sum up, our resolution of being kind is meant through sharing good words and performing good works. As John Wesley wrote, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. We all want our children to grow up to be kind. We cannot just tell them to be kind, but we have to show them by our words and our actions. We have to show them what kindness looks like and let them feel what kindness feels like. Many of us were taught by our parents and other adults to be kind, but maybe we've forgotten these simple lessons. I'll tell you a story of my childhood, which you're probably like, okay, Kirsty, the one you but My sister's brothers and I all had the same kindergarten teacher, which was an amazing fact considering we spanned in age 17 years from the oldest to the youngest. This teacher's name was Mrs. Horton. Everybody in our family remembers her name. This was back in the days when you knew nothing before you went to kindergarten. Her job was to teach you to know your ABCs, count to 20, learn our colors, learn basic shapes, learn how to spell and print our name, and learn our phone number. But amidst all of that, all those things we were supposed to, quote, learn in book learning, were that we were supposed to learn to get along with each other. Now remember, there were very few preschools. Anybody who had working parents were usually taken care of by a grandmother or an aunt or a neighbor who was just like a continuation of our home life. So Mrs. Horlick had to teach us how to play together, behave towards each other, and yes, she had to teach us to be kind to each other. If you took someone's crayon and made them cry, instead of saying, don't do that, she would say, was that kind? And the answer would be no, and the solution would be, give it back. If a girl called another child a name, Mrs. Horlick would say, was that kind? The answer was no. So you would apologize, and the other child would forgive you, and that was that. What if the whole world knew how to give things back? Treat each other with respect, apologize, forgive, and let go. What if we were all kind? What if we made a New Year's resolution this year, I will be kind? I have one year more example for you. My mother was kind. And when I say that, I say that with all sincerity. I'm not making this up for you guys. I kept hearing from her friends and those from our hometown. After my mother passed away, they would always say, your mother was so kind. And she was kind. She would lend a cup of sugar or a few aspirin to a neighbor knowing that they weren't able to repay what was borrowed. She shared vegetables from our home garden with those who didn't have their own. I never once heard her gossip. I never once heard her judge others. She was a teacher, and she had seven children of her own. Yet she was always patient and always kind. How could that be? She never said to one of us, we were, she was disappointed if our grades weren't perfect or if we quarreled with our brothers and sisters. I have very clear memories of how she treated others. There was always concern and consideration for others. She was always pleasant, even if she didn't agree with you, and she never considered herself superior to anyone. One day when I was about five, I remember going to the grocery store with her. There was a man in our town who was a few years younger than my mother and who had come home from fighting in Europe during World War II. He came home a bitter, angry, and damaged man. 
someone who today we would say had PTSD. In our small town, everyone knew he was an alcoholic. He would stop in the bar on Friday nights to cash out his paycheck and to drink up the money he should have been using to buy groceries or pay rent. Rumors were that he beat his wife and children. When he was seen walking down the street, people would literally stop and cross the street just so they wouldn't have to greet him. So that day, when Mom and I were leaving the grocery store, we encountered him sitting on a bench outside the store. His head was down, and he looked as though he was deep in thought, or even as I, the six-year-old thought, he was drunk. My mother approached him, called him by name, asked him how he was doing, and asked about his family. She could have just turned and hurriedly walked the other way, but she didn't. The man recognized her and smiled. He sat up a little straighter and met her eyes as he talked to her. By treating him with dignity, she shared the greatest gift of kindness. I like to think it made a little difference for him, even for just that one day. But just imagine if everyone in town had started showing kindness like that. I wonder if it would have made a difference. What if we all made a New Year's resolution? What if our resolution this year is, I will be kind? Would it end that pandemic of meanness? Would we change the world, even our little part of it? I close today by reminding you that kindness begins in our minds and in our hearts. I leave you the words of Proverbs 3, chapter 3, verse 3. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them always around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and good name in the sight of God and the sight of man. Let it be so. Let it be so.